This is Barry Zelma, Zelma on Insurance. Today I'd like to speak about the equitable remedy of subrogation. Equity, different from the law courts, is a court system designed to provide fairness rather than money. Therefore, equity allows creative remedies for wrongs that do not fit within the confines of traditional tort or contract remedies, that is, with cash. The ancient maxim, for every wrong there is a remedy, codified in California Civil Code Section 3523, applies to subrogation rights. The maxims were adopted from the common law of England and are relied on in all jurisdictions. In California, the maxims were codified in the Civil Code. In Westchester Fire Insurance Company v. Admiral, a 2003 decision of a Texas court, the Texas Court of Appeal stated the elements of a right to the equitable remedy as follows, quote, the two key elements of equitable subrogation are, one, that the party on whose behalf the claimant discharged the debt was primarily liable on the debt, and two, that the claimant paid the debt involuntarily. In this case, Admiral did not contend that Westchester was a volunteer but that Admiral did not owe a debt to its insured for the punitive damages, treble damages, and attorney's fees because they were not covered under Admiral's policy. Close quote. The purpose of equitable subrogation is to prevent forfeiture or unjust enrichment. The roots of equitable subrogation lie in the concept of remedying a mistake. In Hicks v. Londre, a 2005 decision of the Colorado Supreme Court, it observed that equitable subrogation is appropriate when mistake is involved. Equitable subrogation is a doctrine that allows one who has discharged the debt of another to succeed to the rights of the satisfied creditor. For example, if creditor number three pays off a debt owed to creditor number one by the same debtor, equitable subrogation would enable creditor number three to jump ahead of creditor number two in priority for repayment. The doctrine which began in the English courts of equity as a way for a surety to seek repayment from a doubt defaulting debtor has been applied by the Delaware Court of Chancery for over a century, according to Eastern Savings Bank v. Koch, a 2015 decision of the Supreme Court of Delaware. Equitable subrogation is generally permitted only when a person fully discharges a debt secured by a mortgage. Partial subrogation to a mortgage is not permitted because it would have the effect of dividing the security between the original obligee and the subrogee, imposing unexpected burdens and potential complexities of division of the security and marshalling upon the original mortgagee. Specific performance is an equitable remedy which compels someone to do what he or she is promised to do, such as turn over possession of property. Quiet title is another equitable remedy which clarifies who has title to land. It might be required before property can be sold to effect a subrogation recovery. Some cases with subrogation potential available to any insurer are available on nearly every loss an adjuster investigates, no matter how slim the chances of collecting from the other party. The adjuster must listen carefully to what the insured says 
when he or she tells the adjuster what happened. The adjuster should always ask questions with subrogation in mind. The adjuster should think about what the insured would do if the insured had no insurance. The adjuster should also remember that if the wrongdoer is insured, the chances of collection increase logarithmically, even if liability is slim, because of the doctrine of comparative negligence. Some insurers, being highly practical business people, will settle almost any case for the perceived cost of defending it. The adjuster should always be thinking about who, or what, is responsible for the loss. If a if possible, the adjuster should identify the wrongdoer's insurer, since insurers, being professional litigators, are easier to negotiate with than individuals and basic business corporations. Although it is usually the obligation of the insurance adjuster to pay a claim, the adjuster must recognize that he or she is a profit center for the insurer who, by developing a subrogation case, can reduce or eliminate the net loss paid by collecting from others. Failure to consider the person responsible for a loss is a failure of a major duty of any claims person. For example, the fire case is a basis for subrogation. Fires do not normally occur absent the negligence of some person. The adjuster must determine how the fire started, where the fire started, and why it spread. Hiring a fire cause and origin investigator is a good investment in every fire case. If the insured did not accidentally or intentionally set the fire, then the adjuster should be able to exercise the right to subrogation recovery. If an insured clumsily tips over a candle and ignites his sofa, you might think there was no subrogation possible. However, the adjuster must determine who designed and manufactured the candle. Was it safe for the clumsy insured to use? Who designed and manufactured the sofa? Was it too easy to burn and thus unsafe? Who placed the candle where the insured could knock it over? Did he or she breach a duty of care that would cause the insured to foresee a fire? All of these things might result in a subrogation action to recover from the third person someone not involved in the accident but responsible for the fire or its spread. Consider the auto accident as a basis for subrogation. The insured admits he ran a red light and hit a third party. Even this fact situation has a possibility of subrogation. Suppose there was an overhanging tree that it obscured the insured's vision and he could not see the light. The insured and his insurer may have a right back against the owner of the tree, or possibly the city for maintaining its property in a dangerous condition. The stoplights were hidden from the view of motorists. As long as the state where the accident occurred applies the comparative negligence doctrine, the subrogating insurer may recover a portion of the loss. Some leases provide a basis for subrogation. Almost every lease of real or personal property imposes obligations on the lessee and provides rights to the lessor. An insurer may, under the right of subrogation, exercise the rights provided by a lease agreement. Therefore, a thorough claims investigation must include this agreement in every loss where the property is rented by or to an insured. The lease usually tells, as between the lessor and the lessee, 
who is responsible for any casualty to particular pieces of property. The adjuster may find that another insurer, that of the lessor, also insures the tenant's improvements and betterments and is responsible under the lease for the cost to repair them. The lease may contain an express or implied waiver of subrogation. The adjuster must obtain all of the following before beginning an attempt to collect under the right of subrogation. 1. The full name of the insured and his capacity, an individual, corporate officer, employee, trustee, or partner. 2. The date, place, and facts of the loss. 3. If a product is involved, the identity of the product, including its name, manufacturer, model number, serial number, and distributor. 4. The remains of any potentially defective product secured at the request and requirement of the adjuster by an independent testing laboratory. 5. Photographs of everything. 6. Copies of all relevant contracts, leases, and policies of insurance. 7. The names and addresses of all witnesses and any people involved with the origin of the loss, even if they are not witnesses. And 8. A recorded or signed statement from the insured and all witnesses. The adjuster must carefully document all damages and secure the services of an expert if a product is involved or the cause of loss warrants hiring an expert. After completing the investigation, the adjuster must report his or her conclusion to the party or parties at fault with a demand for reimbursement since it will almost never be only one person or entity. The adjuster should estimate the percentages of fault attributable to each party. The adjuster must get a sworn proof of loss properly notarized or signed under penalty of perjury by the insured. The adjuster must, at the time of the agreement to settle and the execution of the proof of loss, have the insured sign a subrogation agreement that assigns to the company all of the rights of the insured. If the adjuster cannot resolve the subrogation claim short of litigation, the information gathered should be given to a lawyer whose practice emphasizes subrogation recovery so that he or she may adequately pursue the right of the insurer to subrogation in the courts. Most insurance companies have contracts with subrogation counsel. For the subrogation effort to be successful, the adjuster should hire his or her own expert for the case. If the adjuster joins with another adjuster representing a different party to hire an expert, some courts will conclude that the insurer has waived the work product protection and require that the reports be disclosed to all defendants. Sometimes the reports of the original expert are less than adequate and can be kept from the defendants by exercise of the work product protection. If the adjuster shares the expert with other insurers, the adjuster may compel the lawyer to disclose information that, because it was written early in the investigation, may be wrong, and or unfavorable to the insurer's case. So, joining with others to pay for experts is not really cost-effective. The adjuster should not let the expert write a report unless it is totally favorable to his case. If the report is unfavorable, the expert should be advised not to write a report. The expert can then be declared to be a consultant and cannot, as a result, be hired by the other side. His or her opinions will be protected work product that cannot be discovered. The expert may have made a mistake, and this would give the insurer the opportunity to get a more competent expert. There is no duty of good faith to tort feasors. The insured, if he was not insured, would have no obligation to tell a third party responsible for his injury 
that he had a poorly written expert report that helps the other side. However, if it was a well-written expert report, it might be worthwhile for the adjuster and the insurer the adjuster represents to simply drop the subrogation case because it's going to be a loser. It doesn't pay to continue a lawsuit you know you cannot win. The adjuster should not attempt to handle a cause investigation that is beyond his or her experience. If the loss is suspicious or requires special expertise, the adjuster should hire an expert. The expert can then give opinions in court. The adjuster must preserve the evidence before letting salvage be carted away. The salvage remaining after a loss can be extremely valuable in establishing the cause and extent of loss. The portion of the salvage that relates to the cause of loss should be preserved carefully so that it is available to prove the insurer's case in court. Allowing such evidence to be disposed of after a loss can give rise to a suit against the company itself for spoliation of evidence that could expose the insured and the insurer to claims for damages. The adjuster should always speak with the in official investigators. The opinion of official investigators, like a fire department arson investigator, may prove an unbiased expert opinion that will carry more weight with a lay jury than an expert who has paid a fee for his or her opinions. The opinions of the official investigators also provide a means to weigh and evaluate the opinions of private experts. The adjuster should not let the insured release the liability of anyone who may be responsible for the damage to the property that is the subject of insurance. The adjuster can explain to the insured that once the claim is paid, the insurer has the right to subrogation as long as it wasn't waived by the insured before the loss or by the insurer in its written policy of insurance, and if the insured deprives the insurer of its right of subrogation, the insured can find itself with no coverage at all. If the insured signs a release after the loss, the insurers whose subrogation rights are derivative only can lose the right to subrogation. This video was adapted from my book, Selma on Insurance Claims, Part 107, Second Edition, which is available as both a Kindle book and a paperback from Amazon.com. If you found this video to be interesting or useful to you or your colleagues, please pass it on. It's free. And please also subscribe to my YouTube channel, my Rumble channel, and click on the like buttons or the rumble buttons when you do. And please also subscribe to my blog and my Substack publications so that you can learn of future blog postings and future videos. Thank you for your attention.